Hi everyone, I'm Nisa. I use she, her pronouns. To start with a visual description, I'm of mixed race Asian descent. I have light tan skin, brown eyes, long straight brown hair. I'm wearing a dark blue shirt with digitally rendered raspberries on it. And I have a yellow jacket over the top. Uh, behind me is the corner of a sofa with a red cushion and a painting of an open book and some sculptures on a striped background. Over to you, Solar Protocol. Hi, thanks, Nisa. Um, I'm Tiga Brain. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I am sitting in front of the obligatory bookcase for Zoom. Um, I have blonde hair and I'm wearing a dark shirt. And yeah, excited to be here. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Nathanson. I have uh, light skin, uh, black gray hair, a short beard, and I'm sitting in front of a uh, white empty wall. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Benedetta Piantella. Uh, pronouns are she, her. I am light skinned. I have light brown hair. I'm wearing giant uh, pink headphones. I am sitting in the middle of chaos in my kids' arts and crafts room with a really big um, map in the background. And I'm wearing a um, 70s tropical uh, dress. Awesome. Well, I've been really looking forward to this conversation with you all, um, which is really an extension of some ongoing dialogues that we've all been having over the past couple of weeks. Um, but maybe to dial back and ease our way into talking about the project, I thought we could um, chat about some of its practical aspects. Um, maybe you could start by explaining, you know, what is a solar server and how do they work? Who wants to take that? <laughs> I can I can take this one. Um, so yeah, so a solar server is ultimately a, a small solar powered uh, computer. Um, we're using a lot of uh, open source hardware uh, that's readily available. So we actually um, run everything off of um, just uh, single board computers like Raspberry Pis. Um, and uh, it's ultimately the physical aspect of it is it's a box. Um, it's a ruggedized box that can withstand all kinds of weather conditions um, and contains the battery and uh, all the hardware needed to talk to the network and basically speak to the internet. And it's uh, powered by a small 50 watt solar panel, which is um, just a very kind of small, compact size. Um, and so that's the, the hardware side of things. Um, and uh, on the software side, the, um, the system uh, basically speaks to the network. And um, when the specific solar server is in a location that has sun at the moment, has the most available sun, um, it's the point of contact for the whole network. And that specific location can serve web content uh, that's hosted at that specific uh, geographical location that's maybe site specific and it's only then visible when that is the, the server that's in the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I love that aspect of um, being able to imagine all of the different servers around the world. And I think that the, the project really um, touches quite poetically on our current COVID moment. You know, we're all trapped in our homes, we're tethered to the internet, and there's this simultaneous experience of being subsumed by our networked existence, but also being completely isolated and displaced at the same time. And so, you, Benedetta, you mentioned the site specificity of the servers and the acknowledgement of their human operators. Um, and in a sense, I think that kind of like reinserts this sense of like narratorial belonging into the experience of the internet. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that collaborative and community-based aspect of the project. Like how did you connect with people? What do those relationships look like? So, yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, so at the moment we have um, servers in uh, the US, Canada, Chile and Australia with one coming online in um, Dominica soon. And those relationships and those sort of collaborations are very specific to um, why people are potentially interested in 
hosting a server in that context. So in some instances, it's a community group and they're gonna have different interests in terms of what they put on the server and also how they engage with it. In other instances, it's academic research. In other instances, it might be an individual who has a, a like a media art practice. Um, and so there's a wide range of things. And what we're working towards is sort of a collaborative design approach where the behavior of the network is you know, based on the constraints of you know, um, the hardware and the environment. We're gonna sort of work with these stewards to um, you know, design the, the actual behaviors and content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've been thinking about the stage that we're at as like the, we started off with just servers here in New York, which was the um, like prototyping it. And now we've, we're doing this like pilot where we have got some in these locations. And so I think the next stage after this launch is to um, start to work with folks who might not be so like technically um, literate or like maybe who aren't from our network. So we're kind of opening it up gradually as our system is more robust and sort of more tested and we're a bit more confident in how, um, yeah, how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of links to something that I've been thinking a lot about over the course of our conversations, which is that the conceptual project involves some kind of um, unfolding and mapping process. And so not only are you kind of, you know, generating new relationships or building new relationships with people as, as you, um, you know, connect and expand where these servers are located, but you're also kind of mapping, mapping the various technological ecological and political infrastructures of the internet and, and computation. And we talked a lot about, I guess, some of the dangers or concerns of, of the current systems that we're all in, ensconced in. Um, I'm wondering if you'd like to kind of give some, some background on that um, and the ways in which that thinking informed your project. Yeah, I think, um... We got, we've gotten very interested in yeah, this, this concept of natural logic and natural intelligence and, um, you know, automation. I think when we talk about automation, immediately I think of a factory, right? Like I think that's the imagination for it. While, you know, a, a thriving ecosystem is grounded in automation, right? It, it, the definition of wilderness is that humans aren't the ones making the decisions. So actually, you know, we live with automation. We always have. And, and I think through this project, we're trying to like attend to that and try to also think about how we could use some of those environmental logics. Yeah. As, as programming, like as, you know, rules and conditions in our, in our system. Mm -hmm. um, which then also leads you to be dealing with like the limitations and the flows and fluxes of that world that you're in and that location that you're in. Like, for example, just I've been joking that it's just like it's snowing and it's dark in New York City. And so it's likely that, you know, all our servers here are going to go down today because it's just like <laughs> the darkest day of the year. Right. But it also means that like, so when we've been working on this project that like when that happens, you're kind of like, OK, well, I got to that's it for today um, so that you know, you, you, the environment is kind of moderating and, and programming rest as well in this really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to build off that, this idea of intermittency and irregularity is sort of anathema to a lot of systems we engage with on the internet and increasingly even in our sort of physical world. Um, and so this project is trying to think about how can we bring those really important elements back into systems. What would it look like for an internet service to only be available when the sun was out? Or what would it look like if you couldn't work remotely late into the night because your server goes down and so you can maybe, you know, actually make dinner or, or read a book or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really, I think that what you're describing really speaks to, speaks directly to, um, what Jaron was sharing about um, uh, Timothy Morton's statement, this idea of like planetary scale reordering of, of social structures, which also necessitates us kind of re-examining or re-evaluating our, our kind of like expectations of our, li of our lived experiences. Um, 
Alex, I really, I love this idea of the relationship between it in the uncommon relationship between intermittency and automation, because whenever we think of automation, like you were saying, Tiga, we think of factories, we think about efficiency. Um, what, I mean, what does this mean for how you understand um, this kind of like go-to concept of sustainability? And I just want to throw in there, it's really, I thought it was really kind of ironic and coincidental that like Bill Gates, you know, the founding father of like tech capitalism or pe perhaps apotheosis of tech capitalism launched this new book about sustainability two days before this talk. <laughs> I just, um, it's, it's been kind of like all consuming all the things that I'm like reading and learning. But yeah, back to the question about sustainability. <laughs> um, yeah, how are you kind of conceptualizing that? Well, I think... You know, the I haven't I haven't looked at the Bill Gates um, <laughs> book, so I'm just going to you know guess what's in it. But I, I'm assuming that the, the version of um, sustainability that he sort of promotes is this you know giant like machines to suck carbon out of the air and like this very like techno utopian like response. And this is we see this from all the Silicon Valley bros, right? Like that's their that's the default <laughs> way that they operate. You know, and, and the, the dream there is that we can sort of like, you know, design technologies to deal with our waste and, and these sorts of issues so that we can just continue on with capitalism and continue on with the social hierarchies that ha we have now. And we don't actually ever have to like look at ourselves and be like, well, you know, should we all be working 40 hour weeks? And, you know, should we be living in this economic system? And should, you know, like all of the questions that are very much have been exposed also through COVID and this in the year of 2020. Um, and so I think with this project, we're very much also looking at how can we see something like a transition to renewables or a ch change in our energy production as this opportunity to also change ourselves and change our culture and like think about like what a low carbon culture looks like not as a like, let's, we have to give up stuff, but like actually it can lead to all these amazing things. Like we, maybe we can't afford to run as much JavaScript on the internet, so we can't use so much tracking, so we can't use so much ML, you know? And so we have then a very different sort of internet that might come about through that. Maybe we can't all work eight, eight hours a week for the rest of our lives and we have to actually, you know, think differently about work um, and with that you know more social safety nets and so on and so on so I think it's actually a really there's a real opportunity here for like positive social change and, and we're trying to kind of open up the imagination for that version of, of sustainability. Yeah I mean we're also trying to create a conversation around what sustainability does or doesn't mean in a media art context because mm -hmm. You know, if, if ultimately, you know, this project is, if our goal was to make the most sustainable in, um, internet service, this is not the project for that, right? Like we would, you know, it would be more efficient, have less of a carbon footprint if we were building a project around, um, you know, a uh, centralized, sustainably energy powered, um, you know, uh, cloud computing service, because those are, those facilities are incredibly efficient and often, you know, increasingly by renewable energy and, and all that. So really what we're trying to think about is like, are there, you know, collaborative community oriented ways to sort of imagine this space? Um, and so, you know, sometimes like resiliency, for example, can be at odds with a purely like sort of, um, uh, carbon, um, uh, um, you know, carbon footprint way of thinking about sustainability. And so I think we're trying to just create a system that sort of illuminates some of those potential contradictions um, and imagine what it could be. Yeah, I mean, I, I really love the idea of kind of this, reframing expect expectation as a, as a central concept to the, to the project. Um, and also kind of peeling back the layers on um, all of the machinations that kind of like inform and, and build up the, the kinds of expectations that we've developed, you know, in through kind of tech, tech capitalism and the, at least, you know, in some parts of the world, the abundance of, of the internet. 
um, and the access that it provides, whether it's high quality video streaming or whatever it might be. Um, and you know, you've you've all touched on kind of the the data piece um, and the and the en energy piece and the way that they're inextricably intertwined and they're um, really building upon you know uh, the our foundational understanding of kind of like the labor capitalism dynamic. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you were touching on with respect to uh, data capitalism and like where the data is living in this project or how, like how it's handled and, and treated by you all um, through sort of solar protocol. Yeah, we, we've spoken so much about this question, right? Like how we manage the architecture of the system and whether we should be doing things like using JavaScript, which obviously runs in the browser, or do we do things on the server? Like, because if you run it in the browser, then you're not using the energy to run it. But then you also don't know what energy is being used to run it, right? Like mm -hmm. most of us are still relying on fossil energy. And so is it then more, more responsible to do the sort of computational work on the server even though it means our servers might go down more because we know it's solar. And, and so that's what we decided to do where we, we try, we're trying to do everything server side in terms of like, you know, the, there's a graphic on the website and, and the real time data stuff um, for that very reason, because we can sort of like account for then like where that energy is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's lots more to explore in that, domain too right like we've all been talking about the next stage too is to sort of I guess really refine some of the software that um, and how it works um, in terms of like how often servers check in and like this idea of real time is very interesting too right like so our system is up updating generally every like 15 minutes is that the right time interval could it be less you know what's the footprint of that so yeah, we're sort of in that that stage now where we can actually really start to experiment with some of those things. And that sort of, I think, also will respond to how participants actually want to use the system because there are some processes that require um, a lot more sort of transferring of data between our servers. And there's others that really can be like very, very minimal. Um, and so I think we're just really excited to start bringing people into that design conversation in a, in a more um, intense way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you, as you make those decisions about kind of like what functions happen where, and um, it seems kind of central to me to kind of re to refer back to something that Jerome was saying with respect to this idea of intuitive knowledges, um, that in fact, the site specificity of your work creates an altogether different type of relationship with the environment. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before about how um, the, you know, the internet is such a dis dislocated experience and you could, you could be anywhere. It doesn't matter where the information is coming from or where you are for that matter. Um, and in fact, uh, Tiga and I were chatting just before the, um, talk started and she was saying uh this could be the worst day for people to access the site <laughs> but maybe maybe the best day because it really highlights the way in which we need to kind of attune our expectations and our sensibilities to you know what's go going on around us um in terms of availability of sunshine kind of like the ec ecological or environmental or weather situation um i'm wondering uh you know, we spoke a little bit about this um, and one of you referenced a really great book and a section of it talking about the honorable harvest and seeing as Jaron, you know, mentioned, you know, the um, importance of recognizing indigenous knowledge sets and kind of like ways of being and how they might fit into the, the state of the world that we have today. I, I mean, I'd love to, hear you kind of like reflect upon some of those um, exchanges that we had particularly about um, what it might be to return to a, a heightened awareness of um, or of, a, of like an ecological relationship. Yeah, that's, that's a book um, called Braiding Sweet Grass um, by um, 
Robin Wall Kimura. I always get her the order of her last name mixed up, but I think I got it right. And it's it's a it's such a gorgeous book. So she's she's a um, you know plant scientist, but also a indigenous um, woman who lives. I think I think she's located up in Buffalo or somewhere upstate New York. And so the book is about these sort of like collision of both knowledge practices and how they come together. And there's this chapter, The Honourable Harvest, where she's really talking about the an Indigenous ethic of renewal, right? So you try to live within the limitations of what you're able to renew in your environment. And she looks at different case studies of people who hunt and, and ways that this sort of takes place. And it really resonated with me in this project because, you know, we are trying to create this web service that lives within the bounds of the energy we can actually locally create, right? So I think that concept is very, yeah, relevant and really, really spoke to us as we were building this. Mm. We've, we've put a reading list on the site um, just in the last day. So a lot of these resources are there too. Mm. Yeah. Um, there was a question that I wanted to ask you about, um, I guess the, um, the idea of sort of like the co-op model or a sharing economy and like what aspects of, of that, um, informed your, your thinking about the project? Well, one thing I want to say is that, you know, we, we, we are sharing resources and we're because of what you were saying that we live in this very sort of disconnected way and we have availability of things 24 seven, we, we don't necessarily acknowledge that. And so I think the, the network that we're trying to create and its relationship with um, natural resources is, is based on really wanting to connect more intimately and, and sort of physically feel that relationship and the fact that we, um, you know, we are sharing these very limited resources, uh, ultimately, um, through this, through this system. And we're, you know, obviously in the process of trying to, to co-design this alternative intimate network, uh, together with, uh, the partners. And, and I think in the process of physically having to build your own infrastructure in your site location. A lot of all these processes um, that are normally kind of very hidden um, are coming to light. And I think people are starting to really connect with not only the technology, but the workings of, you know, the internet and, um, and, and energy systems on a very tangible uh, kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not only is the sort of environmental impact of the internet very abstract and removed from, you know, the average person's understanding, but also there, you know, are relationships to other people, you know, outside of like being on a Zoom call, but, you know, our Gmail accounts are not on our own server. They're on servers with, you know, millions of other people, right? And so I think a lot of what we're trying to do is just make some of those invisible relationships more present. Yeah, in the, in the same way, I guess that, um, you know, as through the process of mapping, you're also making some of those more like nefarious machinations that exist in our current system, more explicitly visible, um, even if it's through kind of like a, a contrast of practices, I guess. Um, you know, in, even in the beginning of the day, I feel like there's been a lot of conversation about this idea of planetary scale. And mm -hmm. this, this kind of takes us, you know, to the opposite end of the spectrum of what we were just talking about, you know, individual relationship building. And, but, um, at the same time, there is, is a certain, um, uh, there is a certain scale that is required for the project in order for, you know, uh, to access the sun as, and make the project as available as possible. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on scale, particularly as, you know, scale, scale and scalability can be such a, you know, um, e exploitative kind of capitalistic practice that is often about um, efficiency and surplus. Um, so, 
how, yeah, how, how are you understanding or defining scale through the course of your project? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we were very excited about the idea too, is like how, do, how could we build this sort of like international, you know, collaborative um, group of folks to build something like this, right? Because like obviously like uh, the more servers we have in more time zones, the more um, distribution we have across the, you know, path of the sun and the, the more resilient the network becomes. So there's this sort of, yeah, the social relationships and the way the work operates socially is intimately tied to the way that it operates technically. So there's this yeah. very interesting kind of dialogue there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the other thing is too, like, um, you know, we are living at this time of a planetary emergency and we are, and, you know, there is, you, I think as the climate crisis worsens, um, we have to find ways to act at, you know, on that scale. And I mean, this is something that Holly Jean Buck, who writes about geoengineering, really points out in her book on the topic is like, you know, I think there has been this tradition of um, not wanting to think about infrastructures at scale, like from certain, like from certain political positions, like the left has really not engaged with that um, historically. And yet we are at a moment where we really have to, right? And if we don't, like other groups are going to. And so how do we sort of think about how we can start to manage these, um, our, you know, our ecology better at a planetary scale, but it, with a model that, that, that we want, right, that, that does favour like equality and social justice and, and isn't just sort of more of the same like extractive capitalist commodify everything. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, there's, that is something that, yeah, I think we, we also have been talking a lot about. Um, we also yeah. kind of think of scale not as just endless growth, right? Like that's sort of the problem. And so for us, when we think of scale, we think of like, what is an appropriate scale that speaks to the affordances or needs of what we're building? And so like Tiga said, you know, if we um, were to place uh, servers around the world, you know, longitudinally, that would give us maybe consistency over the course of a day. And, you know, right now, for example, we have a server uh, in Canada, in um, Trent, Canada, a server in New York, and, a, and some server and a server in, in Chile. And what that does is that's you know a, a, like they're sort of in a line latitudinally, and so that creates opportunities around seasonal changes and things mm -hmm. like. That. So I think when we think of scale, it's like the position of our servers can sort of at different scales creates different opportunities for exploring this idea. Mm -hmm. So it's not about like, can we get a server in every city? It's about, you know, how many do we need in certain locations to create X opportunity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we speak of scale, we automatically just think about what, you know, maybe maybe what Tiga was saying before about the Bill Gates book about, you know, large scale and, and having things be super efficient and running all the time and, and leading to zero disruption, right? What we're really trying to investigate is actually where is the potential of an intermittent internet? You know, like we could blanket the world and have it in every continent so that we minimize the downtime. But we also, part of our conversation with the stewards and with anybody kind of interested in this topic is actually figuring out what are the opportunities of something? What is something that you do want to be on and accessible most of the time or maybe all the time? What is something that you actually really do want to follow some sort of natural cycle and come in and out of your life? Um, and so depending on kind of what we're going to, I think in the next few months come up with together with the rest of our stewards and our, our community is, is going to dictate what scale we should operate at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a really lovely way of, of, I guess, kind of tackling some presumptions about the term. And I guess to return to, you know, this idea of the honorable harvest, um, I think some of you have spoken before about this idea of um, rather than endless growth, it's like, what is the scale that affords you the opportunity to to take only what you need and to use it, you know, respectfully and not wastefully. Um, and so it's great to hear that 
technically as well, you know, what that might look like at a planetary scale. Um, I think, I think those are all the questions that we have time for. I just got a little note, but <laughs> we're over time. So thank you all for sharing about the project. Thank you. So thank much, you. Lisa. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Solo Protocol and Nisa. Um, riveting. I loved what I was hearing. Um, just to reflect back, uh, thank you, Alex, for bringing into the space this idea of intermittency. Uh, and um, I also love the elevation of braiding sweetgrass. I hope everyone accesses that book uh, for your own edification. Uh, it's, it's a practice of like, if you hear it one or, two or twice in a week, that means that you have to, it needs to be yours. And that's, <laughs> I'm reflecting on that. I've heard this book uh, more than once. So I need to dip into somebody's, um, <laughs> somebody's platform to get it. Um, the other thing I really wanted to bring up as well that I heard and that is, is resonant um, is that the specificity and intentionality of, um, of a certain intervention minimizes the unnecessary harm that it might create. Um, and that that specificity creates a scale that would benefit folks. So this lateral understanding of, of, uh, of, mm, of network uh, being solar protocols um, defined lens is actually uh, prioritizing a, a host of other folks. 